So Lou, Lou does not like printers. Um, we've had a, a bad couple of encounters and she decided to interfere with the scanning of our packet, so I had to rescue the packet. Um, all right, uh, welcome back. Well, it's fun. Data 102 is fun because we've got a big, big class. Um, and I'd like to welcome you back. We want to, I want to propose an agenda of making it through our strip survey analysis, which we've been working on with a great deal of love and tumult in some cases. Um, and I appreciate your patience with us going online and figuring out the right tools. So I want to introduce how we want to aggregate those results and we'll have a chunk of shared work time during class in which we will aggregate all of our box plots into a Google Doc and uh, you'll be invited to choose someone else's to analyze. So once again, our standard for data is as an analyst, you are always sharing this with someone else and the scrutiny will, um, we wanna be prepared for scrutiny that could come from a third party looking over your data and asking questions. Um, and that's, that's the exciting part is, can you do an analysis that's thorough enough that someone comes back and says, I was able to make conclusions that I'm confident about as well. So this will probably take, um, this is probably a 45 uh, minute endeavor. And then we'll shift, uh, we'll shift half gears, so to speak, and move from a five number summary that I call non, or a five number summary, which we would think about as non-aggregating statistics meaning the median is reflective. The median is a value that's reflective of a, an ordering of the data, but not a, uh, not a computation that, that involves each one of the individual values. And so we want to move into mean, which we're familiar with, averaging, and the most important cousin of averaging, standard deviation, which is, in my opinion, the... Um, the most underrepresented and underused uh, data statistic in, in all of the, the data world. And if you get nothing out of this class and you decide to move on to something else, um, encouraging you to include standard deviation every single time you share a mean of something. Uh, without deviation, the mean has uh, much weaker explanatory power. So I've, uh, we'll do an activity with standard deviation involving your reaction time. So we'll actually do a test and we'll, we'll aggregate our uh, reaction time using a cool tool from the University of Washington. And then I'll introduce a little um, exercise packet that I'm madly scanning. Um, I realized I had a whole bunch of copies at North and I always I don't know, where'd it go? Person. It's awfully big, you kind of lost. Kind and of then um, I, I'm not at North and I don't have the, the, the packets, so I'm trying to get it for us. Sound good? Any adjustments? Okay. Um, so, welcome those of you that uh, just popped in. Um, I can see some of you, which is great. All it takes is a few for it to feel like a class. Um, so let's jump on to our site and let me show you what I've got cooked up. Babe, I don't know what's so going on. I'm gonna pop here. If I can. A mystery bonnet. A mystery Okay. Um, share screen. Just tap one. All right. So once again, F5 is your friend. Um, this is hot off the press. Our adjustments. So we're here on. Oh, wait. I didn't even save that. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Um, so the document that we want is this one, the strip survey analysis document. Um, and it looks like this. And this is the uh, chance for us to build an aggregated location of all of our analysis in one document, which is cool since we can then start drawing conclusions between uh, multiple surveys and look for patterns. So. We're gonna take a little bit of work time and 
I'll show you how I'm going to do this. I'm actually, I was just getting ready to do it all and things got a little bit too crazy. So each person is going to be assigned a chunk, a, a page in this document in which you can aggregate your analysis from your spreadsheets, spreadsheet work over the week. And then this is where we put our box and whisker plots. And so, um, what I'm going to do is give each one of you a page, um, with copy and paste, and then I'm going to put your names in based on um, your submitted names. And so you'll find your section, you'll put your spectrum question in the box, and then, oh wait, this was left over. So we're trying to, we're trying to standardize across strip surveys. So we have a unified way of analyzing it. So phase sorry, one is. I have, I have oh. a question. Yes. Is that Anna? Um, I'll, I'll, no, it's actually Amy. I'm sorry. Amy, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I opened the uh, document to kind of follow you. Uh -huh. And I noticed that the document is actually auto populating with what you're typing. Is it supposed to? Am I ahead yes. of this? Yes. I'm, I'm editing in real time. Um, okay. So I'm, I did not get all the little adjustments in there. Uh, so I'm doing it as we go. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. And so, uh, I'm out. if I scramble at the beginning, then my brain is in a discombobulated mess. Um, okay, so you're gonna have your section and you'll transfer your data here. So our overall, overall number of responses that you got your median, and then um, you can populate these two if you want. Um, if you've done mean and standard deviation before, which most of you have, feel free to drop those in. But um, right now, the median is, the center is, is where we've been focusing. So the key is your box and whisker plots need to get inserted here. So if you've got them in your Google Drive, I think you can even insert, you probably should be able to insert them from your Google Drive. Um, I'm just checking one here. So maybe if you uploaded the, uh, depending on wherever you uploaded them, you might be able to drop them in. If I go insert image, easiest way is to do it from your computer. If you're logged into Google Drive, it might be, you might be able to just find it over here um, in, in uh, shared with me. In fact, that probably would work if you've uploaded them in one spot and you won't have to re-upload them. So the goal is have your box and whisker plots here. And so we'll take like 15 minutes. Does that sound okay to come to transfer your data over um, into these spots? So um, so we should we should be going into the spring 2020, not the fall one. Oh oh wait wait, sorry, I didn't I didn't rename this. Uh, okay, so it's, I see fall at the top. All right, so I am in the right one. Yeah, I fall 20. I I had uh, names that were not coordinated. So okay. yeah, this is the fall 2020. There is the spring lurking out there that you can take a peek at. So you'll just do this one, the top part, and then. I will invite you to choose one that uh, someone else did to actually do the analysis. And we're just doing a quick pass, so uh, a summary. So how is the overall data distributed? Is it compacted in the center? Is it spread out? Um, and then how did the slice groups compare? So that's why we emphasized using the same box and whisker plot scales so that when we insert them into the Google Doc, the vertical axes line up so our boxes um, have relation to one another. And then if you've got some suggestions for the creator, such as um, if you've found that the two questions, if the slicer question maybe um, you had suggestions for how that could have been uh, maybe more astute or, or he had some ideas, you're welcome to drop those in there. And so this is your chance, this is our chance to put a bow on uh, this project. So 
Um, I apologize for not getting the pasting done, but I'm really fast at uh, copying and pasting. So let me just drop these in and put your names up here. Um, so if you want to start getting your materials together. In fact, I'm going to do this. Evan. So every time I'm clicking on this document, it's bringing me into one that's already completed. For um, the, uh, are you in the one that has a bunch of completed data? Yeah. Uh, you'll want to go into, I think I, I have a, a new link posted on the schedule. Sorry, sometimes my links get away from me because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'm on the, the DAT 102, Tuesday, 15th September. Oh, do I have another one in the schedule by accident? I think, well, um, you know, actually it's the 22nd. It's the link from there, the strip survey results shared GDOC. Okay, so that one needs to disappear. That's the old one. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. And uh, could you show me where the new one is just one more time then? Yep, it's under tonight's row. Okay. So I'm just going to comment that out. Um, so that should have disappeared. Okay, good. So the one we use is tonight's, and so I want to make that um, I want to make that grid on. Okay, so it's this one right there. Um, that's the one we're working on, and. So I'm putting in the names real fast. Ryan. Oh, wait, don't put your name in. I'm sorry. Don't don't jump yet. Uh, Ryan was too fast. I'm putting you in an order. Sorry. Oh, don't type. Don't type. Oh no, it's getting away from us. It's it's lurking. It's got a life of its own. Um, if you just give me one second, I will drop these in. Andrew P. Alexis. And then I'll update the table of contents. It'll be real slick. Uh, Adam. As soon as your name shows up, you can jump into it. Uh, Neil. And Jimmy. It gets a little, the, it's the best, it's not great when we're pasting in things because sometimes everyone's pages will get pushed down, um, but I'd ask for your patience because it's the best we've got for aggregating as a group. And it's really fun to have it all in one place because then we don't have to tinker with all the different documents. Sure, Lee. And so if when you find one, that you're interested in, sign up as the peer analyst. So you'll put your name underneath someone else's that you're interested in doing some poking around in. And you can do that um, at any time. Are well, there's so many of you.
or sorry about this. This might uh, be testing the limits of Google Docs collaborative abilities, but it holds up pretty well. Alev and Alyssa. All right, sorry about that delay. Okay, so now when we go up to the top, then we, this is the magic. So now we say refresh, drink. Okay, so now you can click on your link at the top and it'll jump you down to your private section and you can adjust the title and uh, you're good to go in your section. So this one is sample template. Okay, so let's just review now that I'm de-discombobulated. So step one is to populate your section. Your data. And then step two is to choose a peer uh, and complete analysis. And if you, um, it's not necessarily bad if, uh, it'd be nice if everyone had an analyst, but if you're desperately interested in a topic, for instance, if you did a similar topic and someone already chose that peer, you can copy and paste the analysis section and, and add a second one, which would be kind of cool because it'll give you a chance to see what um, other people are uh, coming up with. So once again, when you get to your section, um, replace the title and curlies with a title for your project and then our table of contents will have an aggregated list of people and titles um, and that's that's super neat questions on on this process we'll take about 15 minutes to do this okay so um, let's try to get it done by uh, 35 after 1835 as a goal. That sound reasonable? Okay, and I'm, I'll be here, of course. Um, We're bringing all this information from the spreadsheet that we made last class. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And so then, that way we have it all in this in a uh, so unified when location. Says, when it says to make a uh, <clears throat> to make one for all the data without slicing, that means for both questions together. That means all of the responses to the spectrum questions not sliced. Okay. Meaning and you have not one. you have not separated out the spectrum questions by people's responses to the slicer. Understood. Okay. Okay, this is the Google magic. This is a fun part. Um, I have four uh, slicer groups. How do I make uh, another two more? Row. Yeah, two more rows for my. Yep, uh, put your cursor uh, in the lower left cell and then hit tab. So if I put it here, I just hit tab and it gives you more rows. Ooh. Sorry, lower right cell. Okay, thank you. Yep. I think that's better.
Okay, recording. I should say recording. Thank you for reminding me. So, um, our most basic analytic tool is where the, the middle of the data is. Where, once again, as, as analysts, we are attempting to take a large group of information and figure out what the appropriate statistical process is for transmitting data about a whole bunch of observations in a small space. And so we start by thinking about, well, where's the middle? And our middle that we've worked on so far is median. Or sorry, the measure of center. So what, where's the center? And we've worked on median so far, which I would label, I don't know if this is the official term, but I would call it, it's, uh, it's non-aggregating meaning we line it up from, we line our observations from small to large, and the median is the, uh, the, uh, the, the middle value or the, the center value. And so this gives us a, this has some pros and cons to it. And the, the advantage is that it's simple to calculate because all we have to be able to do is sort something and count something and to find the middle. Let me zoom in a bit so that my notes are more uh, accessible. That's a little better. So, by the way, I'm tinkering with lighting. Let me just try this. I turned off the fluorescent, so let me know if you think it's better. Is the fluorescent better? They seem pretty similar if you ask me. Okay. All right. Um, so median gives us a non-aggregation center. And so we have 50% of observations on the left and 50% on the right. And those of you that have, uh, lots of us have taken some stats courses, the advantage to median, it's simple to calculate. So um, it's simple uh, and that, in a way, that means it's less error prone. And one of the ways that the median is most useful is because it's not aggregating, meaning it is not, it does not involve a computation that computes a summary value using the magnitudes of each individual, uh, each individual observation. And so what that means is that it is, um, insensitive send to extreme extreme values so if we organize our if we look for our median our smallest value could change by an entire order of magnitude if we're working with a data set that goes from uh, smallest value is 100 and largest is 1,000, and our median is um, 521, if the magnitude of even of our smallest value changes to 3, it's, the median has not changed. So it's unresponsive to these extreme values, which is often quite handy in data sets in which we have a bunch of extreme values that uh, are much larger than the bulk of the, uh, of the observations. And this is particularly true when we're dealing with income. So when we're trying to describe uh, the income across particular groups, we almost always will see a median reported because income is usually has a big long tail to it. Um, so if we were to draw the distribution, um, we could have a big long tail of some very wealthy people and the median will still give us a relatively unbiased measure of center. So we would say, um, if we have a big, long right tail, the median is relatively unaffected. And so it's a useful tool to have. 
However, because it is insensitive to those extreme values, it fails to convey uh, a component of the data, which is how does the how is the center impacted by extreme values, which we often want to know. So that's where our uh, our mean comes in, also known as average, and we're going to look at arithmetic average. And so a mean is another measure of center, and we would think about this as an aggregating measure because we sum up all the values of x uh, and divide by how many values we have. So we often, if we're dealing with a sample, we say the average is often denoted with x bar, and it includes the magnitudes of each individual observation. So if x, x is our variable, and this is our sum symbol, so it means add up all of the x's, and then divide by how many? Number of observations. And so we'll often report mean and median because the mean is sensitive to outliers because they the magnitude of those outliers is part of the statistic sensitive to extremes and so when we put these together the mean and the median we can get a sense of the shape of the distribution of the data by comparing where the median is with respect to the mean. Um, and so we can start drawing pictures with both of these values in the distribution. So let me scoot my camera over. So we can deduce skewness by comparing the location of our centers. So let's do a little section of note on skewness or uh, lopsidedness or tailedness is a is another way that it's um, spoken of. I'm trying to figure out if the right there's a nice section in your book on skewness. So let's draw a couple of uh, samples. So once again, we are um, we're looking at the distribution, so the count of values across uh, the entire range. And well, let's start with the center. So in a symmetric data set whose tails contain are the same length of tail, let's make a little key. So let's use um, blue for median. This coming through. So blue for median and purple for mean. So in a symmetric distribution, our extreme values, we wouldn't, we would say our, whatever extremity of values we have mirror each other across the center of our distribution. So the mean and the median uh, share the same value in the middle. So I'm going to put them side by side to show us that they're both there. 
and now we can see what we mean by sensitive to our outliers. So in a skewed, so income distribution has big, a big long right tail. So we would say that this is skewed to the right extreme extreme values and so who's sensitive to those extreme values are mean because it includes a computation that incorporates the magnitude of each observation whereas the median only is the position of the value with respect to others not incorporating the magnitude of the other values only their ordered location so our mean gets pulled up by the tails because it's factoring in those high values, whereas our median uh, stays closer to where we would think about like the bulk of our observations are. So we could label this, the, the mean gets pulled to the tail. And again, let me know if I'm, my camera is, if we're doing okay camera wise. I'm trying my best. And so we can imagine um, the corollary on our left skewness so if we have a left skewed distribution, where's our mean going to be? It's going to be pulled towards that left tail. Our median will remain more along with our bulk. So mean is pulled to left tail. So in this case, we would say um, median being less, uh, median being less than our mean suggests right skewness or high a high tail versus uh, x bar we could label this x bar so x bar is less than median so incorporating both mean and median into summary statistics gives us a shape of the data just with two numbers, which is extremely handy because it allows us to, in a tabular way, represent the uh, skewness of the data. But our next component of standard deviation is going to raise the question of, well, how would I describe the difference between data that has the same mean and median, but the distribution is tighter. So what about the difference between our black line and our green line? Did that green line show up at all? Yeah, it did. I'm, I'm going to make it red because I think it'll show up better. And so Using English, we might say, well, our red distribution, uh, the red values suggest a more compact distribution of the values around the center, and the black distribution suggests more spread. And this brings up the notion of standard deviation. How much deviation or how much difference is there between the center and where the values far, fall with respect to that center. And so I want to talk 
not in the abstract. And instead, I'd like to gather some primary data. What I've learned, once again, is um, the more personal we can make the data, the more effective the exercises tend to be. So we're going to take a little break. And during that break, I'm going to ask you to test yourselves. And so we'll get some um, real data from the group. We're doing great on time. So we're going to take a break till um, 1940. 740. And during that time, I'm going to ask you to take this brief quiz and input your data. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to be as, this is very simple, um, much less complicated than our strip survey. So um, uh, don't, hopefully we won't, uh, we can keep, uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. Wait, did I not get, okay. Um, stand by for link, get your, hover your fingers over F5, get ready, this is gonna be very exciting. Um, see real time, uh, how not to run a web server, um, editor. Ready, it's coming so close. And then I think there's a timer. We've got to get a timer. AV underscore timer. Oh, no, that's grid on. And this is AV timer. Okay, so let's try this on the schedule. Here we go. Oh, where are you? Done. Minimize. Minimize data, F5. There it is, okay. Um, so your, the test is here. So the little uh, tool built by data analysts at University of uh, Washington. And then your reaction time spreadsheet is here. I pasted in your values. You only have to enter one value in a single cell. Um, hopefully it should be quite straightforward. Um, so what this is gonna do is test your reaction time and It'll ask you to follow the simple procedure five times and it'll come up with the average. So I'll demonstrate. You click to start and then click here on the green light. You wait and then when it's green, you click and it times it 0. 0.312 seconds. And then you give another second, uh, get ready, set, and click. Good. 0. 0.342, click to continue, click here on the green light, get ready, and go. Okay, so you're going to do that five times, and you're going to enter your average in the spreadsheet. And then we're going to learn, ah, you're all doing it so fast. Um, so I'm going to put myself in there because I want to be part of the class. Um, so I'm going to do, and I'll see if I can get Loretta over the break to do it as well. So uh, we'll see if she can do it. Okay, so um, enter your data there. And uh, we'll see you in, uh, can we take 12 minutes? So 7.40, is that all right? Any questions? Nope, sounds good. All right, thanks. We'll see you in 12. I'll keep my speakers on, so if you get stuck, you can chirp. All right. Welcome back. And still recording. Good. Thanks for helping out on. Uh, it's not open to everyone. If you have, did any, I'm, assu I'm assuming it's not. I just haven't. I haven't tested. 
because I was only using the main Gmail account that I uh, share with this class. It should be open public for people that have the link. So um, if you're having problems, please chat me your um, your data and we'll tigger with it. So um, this is fun. So I'm going to erase the measures of center so we have more board space. So one of the uh, principles of our data analytics is that we're often interested not in a particular value, but rather how an individual observation is related to the larger whole. And this is where standard deviation and the associated z-score uh, of an observation tie together into a lovely data analytics package. So. Um, what, I'd, uh, what I'm going to walk us through is calculating our standard deviation, which we'll try doing by hand, uh, and then we'll uh, see that we can do it with a, a formula nicely. So um, let me give me one second on, on here. So standard deviation, uh, abbreviated uh, S or SD, uh, is computed using our mean value. So we start with the center. And the first thing we do is we take each individual value or observed piece of information. And we see how far it is from the center. So we take the observation, or we might say um, x sub i and we subtract it from the mean. So if it's uh, less than the mean, we get a negative value. If it's more than the mean, we get a positive value. And we add all of those up. And then we divide by one less than the number of observations that we have, n minus 1. So let's annotate this for a minute. And So we find out how far is each observation from the mean. And we add up all of those differences. So sum all the differences from the mean and conceptually uh, I'll explain the n minus 1 in a non-mathematical way. We can think about uh, if there's only one observation, there's no distance from a center. So we can think of why do we subtract 1 uh, from n? It's because conceptually, we can't divide by 0. So a standard deviation doesn't have mathematical meaning for a data set of, of one observation. So. Um, We'll say we divide by n minus 1 instead of n because uh, we could think about it as we must have two or more observations to compute a, uh, a standard deviation. And then we take the square root of that whole value in order to bring the uh, the magnitude of the standard deviation into the range of observations. Um, and I forgot our, our square here. So we come up with the difference from the mean, and we square it to deal with the fact that some are going to be to the right and some are going to be to the left. And in this case, we don't care whether it's to the right or the left. So if we square a negative value, we get a positive value out. And we take the square root of a squared value to bring the magnitude back into our normal range. Um, so we can annotate the square um, 
to uh, make all differences positive. And we take the square root um, to bring the magnitude of SD into range of the values. Um, sometimes uh, without the square root, we uh, call that quantity the variance, which is used in some statistical formulas. So standard deviation, the formula might look like it has a bunch of pieces, but the explanation is uh, remarkably intuitive when we start tinkering with the actual data itself. So um, does anyone else, uh, do we have Chris, Andrew, Alexis, Jimmy, Adam, Steve, Kamler, or Scott, still to insert data because I'm gonna I'm gonna trim it. You can submit your observation via chat right away if you want. Anyone else? Okay, so I'm gonna and then I'm gonna encourage you to actually grab this data and uh, do this with me because we're gonna compute it uh, by hand. So let me or um, by component in the spreadsheet. Um, and then this week I'll ask and invite you to do it um, by hand. So I'm going to duplicate this sheet before I begin tinkering too much. So I'm gonna call this uh, uh, computations. And so um, I got I've got to finish mine. I spent so much time testing Lou. Um, so uh, point four one two four. Okay, and now. Um, when I tested Lou, she was she was up in the the point eight four five range. So that she was, I uh, she's a little a little slow. Sometimes I think her paw gets in the way um, of getting a quick reaction time. So I'm going to drop these values, and then I'm going to encourage you to pull these all over into uh, your own Google Sheet if you'd like to tinker with me. Oh no. Don't click. Damn. Uh, why is that not working? Delete selected rows. Okay, so here's our observations. So I would uh, encourage you to grab it and just copy and paste it into your own spreadsheet um, so you can tinker with me, because oh, this, is, this is cool. So let's compute our uh, standard deviation. So what I'm gonna do is, let's compute the components uh, one by one, uh, but first let's get our basic summary stats. So let's um, get the median of all the observations, and we'll Give it the formula for median. So the middle value is 0 0.3104, and then let's get the mean. Uh, well, let's 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 do this one by one. So let's actually compute the mean by itself. So we'll uh, we'll sum them all up, and we'll count them. See how many we've got. And so our mean is going to be our sum divided by our count. Uh, 
I'll give you a minute to get here together if you're doing this on your own. So those are our basic computations. Questions on how we got that so far? Um, I'll put the name of the formula here. So I'll say um, median sum count and then divide sum over count. Okay, so there's our mean. Now notice already, um, what kind of skewness do we have? Skewness, so we see that what's larger, the mean or the median? The mean. The mean, so we have, uh, we have right skewed data. So right skewed because our uh, x bar is greater than median. So now let's, um, now we want to figure out how far each of our values is from the mean. So we're going to do, uh, we're going to build this formula together. So we're going to grab, I'm going to, we're going to compute this quantity in its own column because that's applicable to each individual observation. So let's do that. So we're going to say, um, uh, um, distance from mean, and I'm going to use my named range. So I'm going to name this range. Uh, yeah, thank you. You just explained how handy it is. Um, why didn't it let me do it? Do I type it in here? At, oh, there it is. Okay, so mean. Great. So now I can say distance from mean. So I'm going to take my value on the left and I'm going to subtract it from the mean. And I don't need to worry about absolute references because the named range is by definition an absolute reference. So I'm going to formula paste down. Insert one left. I'm going to squish this over. OK, so we found our distance from the mean. Notice we have our above and belows. We've got positive and negatives. Um, and this is great. We've got some, some big outliers. Neil uh, is an outlier, and Loretta is an outlier. So that's kind of cool. So now we want to square our distance, square distance. Um, so I'm going to take this value um, and multiply it by itself. So this will get us a positive value. So we get rid of our positives, our, our negatives. So now we've computed this quantity here. So now we've done this in its own column. And so now we want to add all that up. So let me, I'm going to make these a separate color so it's clear. Maybe something more interesting like blue. Okay. So then, and we don't need the term or the student name. So now let's do sum of squared distances. So this is going to be the sum of all the squares. And then we're going to um, now take the square root of 
this value divided by n minus 1. So this is our st dev. So this is going to be our big formula. So equals sq rt square root of the sum of our squares divided by the quantity count minus one. I'm going to screenshot this. Okay, so is everyone with me? Yes. Ryan's with me. Good. All right. Oh, all right. So we have a standard deviation of 0 0.521. What does that mean? Um, standard deviation is a is a is a unitless value uh, mathematically. So it it doesn't take on um, no, that's not. I'm sorry. That's that's incorrect. It's not unitless. It takes on our our um, the unit of our of our measurement. So we would say the standard deviation is 0 0.521 seconds. Now, that's all uh, lovely, but this comes into play. Uh, even more poignantly, when we then compute uh, one more additional value with respect to each observation, which is the z-score of each individual observation. And so let's put the formula up for z-score, and then we'll tinker with this for a minute. So I'm going to stop my share. So standard deviation and z-score are closely related. Because what we often want to be able to do is say, OK, if our, um, let's, let's make a histogram of our data for a second. Sorry, I'm probably making you dizzy with my screen shares. So let's do, I'm going to zoom back out. So let's make a histogram. Of the observations. Go away. No data. I just gave you data. Let's try and let's name this range. Um, OBS. So let's make, try this again, insert chart. Um, Instagram data range. Well, let me do that. Uh, Come on, Google. I expected more. Okay, I didn't like my name range. So now we've got it selected. Hopefully, with it selected, it'll get us better. Third time. Overall reaction time.
good. Now I want, I clearly need more bins. So I'm going to customize it. Histogram, uh, bucket size. I want, I want to tell you. No, I want to tell you the number of buckets. Show item dividers. They changed this. We were able to do this before, weren't we? What number of buckets? Grr. Okay, well let's let's move this over to stat key. Uh, one quantitative variable. So let's, um, so what I'm doing here is I jumped into stat key, lock five stat.com slash stat key. I'm going to uh, chat this out. This will become our friend moving forward. Um, of course, when I'm screen sharing, it makes it harder to get there. Uh, everyone meeting. And great. Okay, so once we jump in here, then we said one quantitative variable. And then I can go edit data and I'm going to paste it all in. Where did you go? Copy it and I do a control A to select everything and then paste it in. And now in this box, um, we tell it that uh, we have neither, it does not have a header row and the first column is not an identifier. We're just pasting in a raw list of observations. Okay. And that is a, so we can see we've got this big uh, right skewed tail. Um, and we get our summary statistics over here. We can, sem we can uh, verify ourselves um, what we did computationally, standard deviation of 0.521 with a mean of 0.463 and our middle of 0 0.310. So we, we get this nice little mound shape, although it's not a very, oh no, here's the histogram. It'll give us a nice histogram, good. Um, and now if we, so we've got this outlier there, we can come in here and set our limits and we can say, if we set our limit, removing the outlier for a second, we'll get a better shape. Um, so I just moved it to chop it one second. So we get a nice, this is mound shaped enough for statisticians. Matt, we, we're pretty liberal with our sense of a mound shape and we can get our, uh, our box plot. Here's a good example of our two outliers. So lose an outlier and we had another student outlier, 2.66 seconds with a nice cluster down here uh, in under a half a second. So um, what we really want to be able to do is it's not, um, it's almost always the comparison of observations that we're interested in from a data standpoint. And I don't have a good sense for what 0.3 seconds is, but what I'd be curious about is 
um, what, what kinds of observations or which individuals in the group um, are extreme values whose, uh, you know, if we're thinking about um, kind of competencies and uh, the results of, of some tests, we want to think about who's, who's far away from the center of the pack for whatever reason. Um, and so the way we can think about that is compute how many standard deviations is each individual observation from the center. And so the z-score uh, is the most useful way to do that. So z-score uh, is simply, so this is a, uh, a value computed by observation. And our z-score we get by taking the observation i sub i, and we once again subtract it from the center, the mean, and then we divide it by what? By our standard deviation. So one way to think about z-score uh, is uh, the number of standard deviations an observation is from the center. So let's try computing that. So this is where we can start attaching um, this allows us to describe how an individual observation exists with respect to the larger group. Um, and so for each one of these, did we, we, we labeled our mean, I believe, yep. So our z-score, we compute by taking our individual observation, x sub i, we subtract it from our mean, and then we divide it by our standard deviation. And I'm gonna name that range and we'll get a chance to catch up. So add named range, standard deviation. So now I can come back here and say, observation minus the mean. So how far are you, how far are you from the mean? And then divide that by a, uh, the standard deviation, the descriptor of, on average, how far are values from the center. So I'm going to divide that by the standard deviation, so I get a, a z-score. Now you're thinking, all right, well, so what? Well, the interesting phenomena that we find is the standard deviation is becomes particularly helpful. Am I off screen share? Um, do, I need, do I need to, let me put that up again. Put that up for a second. So we can think about, once again, I'll annotate this, is um, how many standard deviations is this observation from the center? That's what our z-score tells us. No, oh, sorry, Luke. Come on in. Hi. So we get an interesting phenomena, which is in the normal distribution of data in mound-shaped distributions, um, the pattern of distribution is closely related to 
the standard deviation of that information. And so a, uh, I think I have There we go. So um, what we're looking at here is, and let me actually, before I get too far, let me link that over here. Wow. Yeah. Hi. So I'm going to add this to our Link there. Okay. So um, if you want to follow along with me, do a refresh, magic key, normal distribution scales. So in a mound shaped distribution, the most exciting component of the normal bell shaped curve is predictable percentages of observations fall within multiples of standard deviations. Um, and so what this allows us to do is, given the assumption that the values are normally distributed, which is the case in many, many, many um, uh, data sets gathered in, 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 our, in our world, from physical phenomena to human phenomena uh, and more, With these scales and the individual z-score together, we are able to understand uh, the significance of a particular observation with respect to all the other observations. That was a sad little bell curve for this most important diagram. Um, watch, I won't do much better on my second try. That's better. So here's our... Um, here's our mean, x bar, and so in normally distributed data, the, the bell-shaped curve, the, uh, it's called a, a Gaussian distribution, is the mathematical term, um, 34.1% of all observations fall to the left of the mean, another 34.1% fall to the right, which together give us 68%, 68.2% of all observations are plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. And then you can imagine that the area, not imagine, mathematically, the area under the curve, um, the integral of the Gaussian curve, 68.2% of all of the area underneath this entire curve falls between uh, minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation from the mean. And then within two standard deviations of the mean, we get almost all the rest of the data. So 13.6 fall on either side between minus two and plus two standard deviations, 13.6%. So together, uh, we have 34.1 times 2 plus 13.6 plus 13.6. 95.4% of all observations are plus or minus 2 standard deviations from the mean in normally distributed data. And only... 2.4%, 2.14% fall between 2 and 3. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, where did you fall in the sand, did you? So, what this says is, if I tell you that someone's z-score, so who was our, who was our outlier? We had, um, if we go back to look at the actual data. Loretta and Neil. Yeah, Loretta and Neil. Um, Loretta is still within the pack, but take a look at Neil. Where did Neil go? Uh, there's Neil. Whoa! If I, all I have to do is tell you, person X's observation has a z-score of 4.21. Knowing that and holding the assumption true that the data is normally distributed, how unlikely, how, how unusual is that observation with respect to the rest of our data? It's extremely unusual. It's fantastically unusual um, because almost all, a vast majority, are going to fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And so these computations allow us to make evaluations of how extreme is a value. And the way that we explain that extremity is by relating an individual score to how spread out the rest of the data are. And so uh, this rule of thumb of plus or minus two standard deviations around the mean, grab almost all the data, uh, begins to uh, have a lot of power because if we're looking for outliers, this is another common outlier test, um, which is if a value z-score is greater than two, um, it's extremely unusual and it's worth looking into. Um, and so you can imagine if you were testing people's reaction time, you don't, uh, the absolute reaction time is much less important than how unusual is a given reaction time with respect to all the others. So is Lou's reaction time particularly unusual? Well, no, it's still within, uh, it's still within the pack, uh, meaning it would be expected given normally distributed data that some would fall, uh, you know, about two thirds will be plus or minus one standard deviation. But Neil's score of 4.21 is astronomically uh, unusual, uh, which is a powerful way of describing the observation um, with respect to the rest of the, the pieces of data in the pack. Questions so far? And so let's, let's finish up our little diagram. Um, so what did we say with three? So then within three standard deviations, we have 99% Ninety-nine point six percent percent of all observations are plus or minus three standard deviations. So, um, one interesting process that we can then start doing is comparing uh, the standard deviation of uh, various data sets, and so uh, a sample might be. If we jump over to um, my grading world, the standard deviation is most powerful when we're comparing two, uh, two subsets of data because we can get a sense for which one is more spread out than the other. So if we go to our um, the letter grades that I've submitted to the Community College of Allegheny County over the last several terms. Um, we can start doing some interesting, uh, interesting uh, summarizing of that. So we could ask, 
Well, how far, um, if we wanted to compare how spread out our uh, grades uh, uh, between different classes, that's where computing the standard deviation um, can be extremely meaningful. So let me do a quick uh, tinkering here. So I'm gonna say uh, duplicate this. copy of master letter grades. And so I'm going to do a quick filter on these. And so let's do, um, let's do only final grades. I said only final grades. I said only final grades. Oh, okay, look, the okay button is down there. Okay, all right, there we go. Um, so now if we get um, entered points, well, I'm sorry, I, I should, I don't wanna do this live right now. Um, why don't we look at our strip surveys? So um, some of you computed standard deviation um, within your groups. And so this allows us to immediately compare how, how spread out are the data around the center, which gives you a good sense of um, how meaningful is the center. So the more spread out a piece of data is, the less meaningful it is to make decisions based on knowing only the center. So here's our, um, our parallel parking example by Adam. Thanks, Adam. Um, we could say the standard deviation of our suburban is significantly more, or not significantly, but slightly more spread out um, than those that parked in the urban area. So the synonym in your brain, standard deviation is, is spread, how spread out uh, are the data between one another. And so um, a fun thing that you might do would be to add standard deviation to your uh, computations for your strip surveys and realize that built into the spreadsheet is obviously a standard deviation tool. So let's double check ourselves, so we'll say, using a uh, function. So it'll do all of those subcalculations for you uh, with STDEV. And so we can verify our, our time, our calculations. Good, it worked. Um, so computing this for multiple chunks of data uh, is super handy. I was tempted to have us do an experimental condition and do a retest of the um, the uh, reaction times, but I, I worried about complicated things too much. Um, but standard deviation, spread, and z-score, uh, very powerful tools. Um, questions so far? Okay, this is good. So. Um, the plan moving forward is next week we have built, I've built an activity that I'm gonna strategically figure out how to turn online um, this week, uh, which will invite you to internalize and, and actually make decisions based on the standard deviation, mean, median, uh, min and max of a variety of data sets. Um, and it's known as the distribution challenge. And so um, I'll be splitting you up into groups to make, uh, to do some explorations of the data that I've assembled from a variety of different sources. And in order to practice, I have created, or not created, I actually not created, this is one of the few things that I have not created for this class, is I'd like you to practice a little this week on the concepts that we've worked so on so far and to do that, I've uploaded a open course 
uh, University of Michigan stats course that they put on um, Creative Commons. And so it's, uh, it's a packet that invites you to review what we've worked on so far. Um, if we were in person, I would, I would print it out for you. Um, I encourage you to, if you've got a printer, to print it out. Uh, if not, you could use a separate sheet of paper. But this has a series of little exercises that review all of the things we've worked on so far. Um, and this was what I was attempting to scan unsuccessfully before class started. So this uh, invites you to pull together uh, the things we've worked on so far, like I said. And there's little um, exercises built in. So if you're um, working on paper instead of printing it out, uh, what you'll want to do is read the sections where the authors propose data from a, a couple of different studies that they did, and it'll invite you to uh, compute some of our basic statistics uh, about mean and median and skewness and histograms um, uh, so far uh, in the class. And so uh, we see some of these concepts coming up again, um, and these will be the five number summaries will be familiar and IQR. And so what I'll do when next week comes around, right before we start class next week, I will open up a key. I have the key already uploaded to the server, and so I'll activate that link uh, starting at the uh, beginning of class. We'll take a few minutes at the beginning to review um, your responses to that uh, worksheet packet. Um, and I've found students have I've balanced sending worksheets out and not sending worksheets out. So this is the only packet that I have uh, for this class, and students have found it quite helpful to do that review. So that's your, uh, your to-do list will be finish up the strip survey from the week, if not, and then uh, complete the activity of the chapters one handout that will help internalize these concepts. And then next week, the distribution challenge will be upon us. So let me pause there and ask for some questions on these concepts. And we will be um, conference intervals and uh, sampling are all rooted in uh, these basic statistical concepts. So these are these will stay with us for a long time. Where are the chapter handouts? They are in the our schedule. So right here. DAT 102, right here is the PDF. Link. Other questions? Uh, which unit uh, should you, uh, should we uh, study, you recommend, uh, in our book? Um, that's a good question. I should put that on there as well. Um, this is all in chapter two, describing data. So section 2.2 .2 through 2.5. Uh, 2 .2 so let me put that in the schedule too. Um, and my plan, if I had more time, I, I'd like to transition away from that extra packet. Um, and use the book exclusively, but the concepts are um, they're, they're so universal that the book and the packet uh, work together really well, even though they're not technically from the same source. So I apologize that those aren't all unified yet. Um, let me put that in the schedule. So, um, so this is the lock five book sections. This would be chapter two, sections one through everything up until 2.6, which is what introduces um, multivariate data. So sorry, up through 2.5, not including 2.5. So sections one through sections four. Okay, so now if we come back here, refresh, 
There we go. Um, thank you for asking. This is good. We got um, strip surveys done, and we're well on our way with standard deviation and z scores. And uh, if nothing else, uh, if I could, uh, I'm afraid I accidentally uh, dumped. Yeah, I, I did. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I accidentally dumped all of the chat because I wanted to do the breakout room. So if you wouldn't mind chatting me your name and, and time one more time before you go. Thanks again for your patience with all of this. Um, I Not all perfect, but I'm trying. So I don't need I'll, to. Sorry, we won't need to upload our um, our workbook, right? Nope, nope. It's uh, this is individual work. I at this at this stage, uh, I think you comparing yourself to the key is is sufficient. So, but I what I do want to do is write down questions that you could bring to the group that we could clarify as a class next week. Okay. Some of you looking a little tired, and I appreciate again your patience with all of this. Um, we're forging a new, a new path through COVID land uh, with DAT 102. So, and I will, I'm going to start processing the videos right away, and I'm, I'm renewing my personal quest to try to stay on top of some of my videos. So, um, I'll try to try to do it by the end of Thursday. So, thanks again. Um, if no, no other questions. Feel free to zoom off and have a lovely night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night. See you, Adam. Oh, Monica, you're back. Great. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I am back. Yep, <laughs> I'm, I'm sending I, you a message now. Okay. Great. I, and I, I read the earlier one, and I, I again I apologize for being so late on posting things. Take your time on getting updated with things. Um, it's okay. I appreciate it, and uh, I, you know, it's not just that. I also just fell behind, notwithstanding, you know, not just yeah. because of the videos. It's just things. Well, I know that, that feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I'll get. Yeah, I'll catch up. But. Uh, uh, I actually do have a question. Well, I don't know if I have a question yet. I, I guess I wanted to start thinking ahead about the final project. Yes. Because I know that I'm going to need to do think ahead mm -hmm. uh, for planning. And um, I don't know if there's any up to, like information. I, not that I want anybody to start thinking before they should need to think about it. But I was just I was looking at past. Um, past what the semesters of like yeah. just examples of final projects to figure out like what am I supposed to do for it yes, so on, I'm on just website. trying to look at like data I work for like for my comfort I work for the Department of Human Services of Allegheny uh -huh. County so I was just thinking about social work related yeah great yeah um, so the, the simple answer is the specs I don't know if you saw this page before um, but this is the specs are already up, so you could do a read through that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's right here under DAT 102 projects, final project specs. Okay. Um, it gives you a sense of what you can put on your your final poster. I haven't decided how to submit this digitally yet, but it'll be something. Um, and then your final project gallery. So um, your your prescience and thinking ahead is uh, appreciated and. Um, I may have cut you off. Did you have a sense of what data from your work that might be relevant that you could use? Uh, they have a website of different, they use Tableau for a mm -hmm. lot of data visualizations. Yeah. So uh, they don't have the most updated data sets, but they do have a lot of, the way they have data isn't, it's on Allegheny County Analytics.us. So I was looking through that and thinking oh. about my work with homelessness. Great. Uh, I serve people who are homeless. And so I don't know, I, I'm still brainstorming. Um, I'm looking through, like I'm trying to figure out, it looks like your your requirement for a compelling inquiry question as it was called on the specs, yes. I did see those. It seems kind of broad. I mean, um, I guess one other thing I'm trying to figure out is how to make it so that I'm not using sensitive client data 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. You don't want to break any rules with, I don't know, HIPAA or whatever. For so, sure. uh, <laughs> so I'm just trying to look at the public and, and actually with where I work, you know, there's private data sets that only certain users have access to, and there's just mm -hmm. public data sets. So I'm strictly looking at the public data sets as if I didn't even work for it, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so I was just going off of the website and I'm trying to figure out maybe like not so much the most original question ever, but maybe just something that either needs to be updated, mm -hmm. like questions that may have been explored like 10 years ago and just need like a fresh, just maybe something like that. Uh, uh, I, they're usually touch upon homelessness, child welfare, um, behavioral health, um, substance use, abu abuse, what, things like that. So it's, it's a range of things. Um, yeah, I'm just brainstorming, trying to figure it out. I haven't actually come up with a question yet, but I guess it seemed to me that as long as the question, you're answering some kind of question about a particular subpopulation within a bigger population that's of interest to you, and then um, provide and it's good to make sure that your data that you're using is it looks like it's secondary data sources we look at you yeah. know it's not like we're going out in the field and collecting raw data like our you know what I mean like starting from scratch but um, if I can find things like that so I'm looking I, I'm, I'm in the process of just like looking through that website of public information and to see what I can come up with for that or what so I, that's where I am with it. And I don't know if I'm on the right track at all or not. I was even thinking about reaching out to a certain department or a particular people. Yeah, that's I what I was thinking too. If they had, sometimes managers have lots of questions that they are wondering about but may not have been able to um, in, uh, investigate yet. Um, or get manpower for. I was curious yeah. about trying to just do an intern kind of thing <laughs> for another <laughs> For somebody I know at the where yeah. I work, so in and another so like in the analyst in that department, I work I work directly with clients, but there's another uh -huh. department that obviously handles research questions. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the the big the big uh, divider in the project. So my first term through, I encouraged everyone to use secondary data sets because that's what I had done in my data analytics programs and was most familiar with. So the, the way that worked is that a lot of people spent uh, way too much time uh, looking for data and much less time thinking about designing data gathering tools and doing the analysis. Okay. So um, as you've seen with the most recent round of projects, I have since moved to encouraging people to uh, actually gather their own data um, based on the process that we're going to do with the library book sampling next. And so um, both are uh, completely open. And since you work in a field that um, has a lot of, there's lots of ways that human services can benefit from thoughtful data analytics. And because you're really familiar probably with some of that data, this might be a good, uh, a good, you might be a good case for someone that would be working with secondary data. Um, but I would encourage you to not limit yourself yet to just using secondary data because I think that there's a lot of richness that comes from still gathering and creating your own data set yourself. Um, and so um, you said you work directly with clients? Yeah, I do. It's with we're a, so the uh, we're a resource and referral center. We work with clients who are homeless, families who are on the risk of homeless, being homeless, and we just yeah. we do coordinated entry for the homeless um, in yeah. Allegheny County. So I'll be. I mean, just if you call, if yeah, I mean, I assist with people who are aging and disabled, uh, just finding resources to help them with, you know be more I don't know self-sufficient or getting what they need I mean yeah yeah um, so it's really variety I mean it could be there's a bunch of things I could touch on I think it's tricky I do agree I understand what you're saying with getting lost it, I noticed myself just when I was looking sifting through different publications just like how quickly you can get lost into like just that that review of literature yeah. and not actually 
doing, you know, data analysis yourself, if you will, or working through the questions, it, it's a lot You're, to just go through the secondary sources. So uh, the only problem I see is that if I stick, I feel like if I do this, the first thing you mentioned there on the left, uh, yeah, gathering data yourself, it would, ha I'd have to scale it back mm -hmm. to something manageable within this semester. And it would have to be something that gets around being sensitive to client data. I mean, if sure. you're talking about, because you have to be confidential with data. I mean, absolutely. You're gonna find people, you know. Um, I think now that, because you're thinking about it so early, um, it might, if you have a good relationship with your managers and so forth, it's the kind of thing that I think with a little bit of planning, you could, um, you could probably anonymize things quite well if you were to sample some, if you were to ask a question about your actual work processes that you undergo, I think you could make a good case for um, gathering the data based on your actual work in real time. Maybe it's uh, asking questions about what, uh, you know, investigating patterns within those that you are coordinating and offering services to. And one thing to remember about HIPAA stuff is it's, you're more than welcome to not share any of your raw data at all with anyone and only share the digestion of it in which case there's um there you have a much uh um if, if you're not trying to anonymize the raw data for other people to analyze you uh and you keep it all behind a privacy wall i would think that you could quite safely um gather your own data maintain privacy and investigate a meaningful question um, so as you're thinking keep yourself open to that uh, it could be something as simple as recording um, figuring out what kinds of information about your clients that you're working with that you may not be gathering now that might help you answer a question that your team has been wondering about for for some time so it might be as simple as uh, just uh, recording a few more columns of data on folks that that you coordinate and work with that could make a pretty big impact in in your work so i think we might be able to find a sweet spot there yeah i see what you're saying i think that is a good next step and that's why i was thinking about it early because i am aware that if i want to ask my program manager of allegheny link and where i work and also potentially the the analysts that they worked with on like predictive analytics and stuff yeah uh, great. if i do it early uh, yeah i would i would need to do it or i would need to get that ball rolling like soon so do you work um, with someone named marilyn mm, i don't know that name i know that we like andy half hill rings a bell to me my okay. manager is andrea bustos okay. um so yeah i don't I, I'm yeah. I, I was just curious. I'm sure by a couple of degrees. I don't personally like directly, but by probably a couple of degrees, maybe even one degree of separation, I do. You know, like I'm probably connected. Great. Well, I'm really glad you're thinking early about it and trying to make it meaningful. That's why we're here. Thanks. Yeah. Thank now you. Now I'll just get my homework done. <laughs> so okay, have wait. fun. Standard deviation. It's the gold. First step. Yeah. The analytic gold. All right. Thanks. Yep. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Yep. I'm also interested in using uh, data from, from my job uh -huh. um, that we already have. Yeah. I, as far as the like gather it yourself, that's part of my job is I'm the first point of contact for our external users for filling out our forms where we're collecting our data. Does that count? Yeah, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I work with this data regularly, cleaning it, vetting it. I don't know if that. Awesome. And so, um, yeah, the more the more you can make any projects we do in this class complement or dovetail work that you're already doing, that's why we're here. Um, so yeah, keep keep the wheels going. And um, uh, as you have ideas, please let us know because I think people stick around and like to soak up things that other people are thinking about. And just out of curiosity, Alyssa, what kind of what kind of clients, what domain are you working in? uh theological education oh that's right for, you mentioned that yeah. i think you mentioned that earlier that's cool that's for really higher neat. for higher ed um, yeah great thanks 
other questions out there from uh, folks still on the call?